Okay, good morning for the ones that uh, stayed here in the first session uh, conference room. Uh, good morning even to people who are watching uh, this discussion through live stream. Uh, my name is Peter Haber. I'm going to be hosting this panel discussion. I'm going to introduce this gentleman in quite a little while. Uh, just f a few organizational information for you. Uh, you can ask questions on Slido. I think that you already get a, got a hang of that already. Uh, we are going to have uh, different events. Uh, one is in this room, one is in the room that you, you've probably came across when you came into the building when you were registrating. And also there's a hackathon taking place uh, right next doors. It's going to end around 16.30. And after that, after 5 o'clock, you can also expect a uh, jazz night. Uh, if you want to uh, settle or manage some B2B meetings, there's a mobile application called Good Event, so you can do it through that. You probably already got an email uh, regarding this, this kind of issue, but I won't uh, go into any, any other details because uh, we, we have our <laughs> time not secured in this, at this moment, really. Uh, I'm going to introduce the gentleman uh, I'm going to start uh, from the left side, your right side, uh, Mr. Balash Felwegi, uh, CEO and co-founder of Blue Ops. Welcome. <laughs> Mr. Peter Pasek from AK Slovakia. <laughs> Mr. Eric Chebi, co-founder at Database Data Tree. Sorry. <laughs> and Ambach Agrawal, co-founder and CEO of SEPI AI. Well, you probably already know because you're sitting o over here that we are going to talk about rob rob robotization at the, in the financial, financial sector. Uh, these gentlemen are going to introduce uh, their work and uh, their projects they are working right now. And then we can take some questions. I'm going to ask some questions as well. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to ask all the time. So I think we can start uh, from you uh, because we made the introduction from the other side. So. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, well, you, you, can, you can start. Uh, so a quick introduction about uh, Zappi and myself. So I come from artificial... Can you hear? Oh, hello. It's working, yeah. Yeah, that's working. Uh, so yeah, I come from artificial intelligence and machine learning background. Zappi is a process automation software. What makes it unique is basically it learns by observing uh, the user behavior or observing employees or doing the work normally and providing them automations on the fly. So things like such as uploading data, uh, filling up forms, reconciling between files can be automated within a minute with Zappi. All right, Mr. Chebi. Hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Chebi from Datatree. Uh, so we are a data science company and we do two things. Uh, one, we want to make retail banking more personal than it is. What that means is we want to help banks communicate with clients at the right time with the right message, which this requires is understanding what is happening in the life of a client and then uh, coming up with a good message or with a, with a good offer. So we work with transaction histories. We have developed software that uh, analyzes these and then helps, as I said, banks make uh, right contact at the right time. That's one and two, we're extending our work uh, to build an automated financial advisor, which you can imagine an engine that combines AI, uh, behavioral sciences, and, uh, and a delivery through chat. And the idea is to really bring the good financial advisory to people's life through digital, digital channels. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Peter Bacek. As already mentioned, I am managing director and partner of company AKs. The question, what I'm doing here, that's a good question because I'm coming from BPO and advisory sector. So I'm, I have nothing to do with the finance. I need to be honest to you. Uh, we have many, uh, many of our clients are banks or company uh, coming from the fintech sector. We are representing them. We are doing for them uh, bookkeeping. We are doing for them payroll. We are doing for them consultancy. But maybe why I'm here, because we have really good experience with robotization at all. Uh, we established our company 12, zir 12 years ago, 2006. That's time there was really like 10 people on the board, so a really small accounting farm. Currently now we have probably 1,000 people working for our company. 120 are sitting here in Bratislava. 20 out of them are IT. I believe in it that uh, I don't think there is other accounting farm here in Slovakia who has 20 people just doing IT. So we are really IT oriented. 
what we did like 10 years ago, we decided that we would do something else compared to our competitors. So we don't want to be traditional bookkeeping company, just having documents on one side of the table. And, um, and in the end of, on the end of the day, everything will be posted in the system. We decided we, we establish our share service center, one of the share, cent share, se share service center we have in Brno. And uh, we develop our own OCR solution. So typical like workflow or a typical job, uh, how it look like the typical job of our bookkeeper is different than like the bookkeepers in other company. So all of our clients are sending us documents not directly to us, but sending us to the shared service center. There we have a special scanning system. We have a uh, validator, we have a people that are training the system. And uh, when our bookkeeper are coming here in Bratislava to the office, they have uh, two screens in front of them. On one screen, you can see the copy of the documents. On the second screen, you can see the documents already put or posted in our system. So our people, they are, knowing, do, uh, don't do, they are not doing the typical manual work, as is usually done by the bookkeepers. They are just checking if the system booked everything correctly. What is unique on our system that we are not one company. We have thousands thousands of the clients. So if you will come to us next day, we have to be ready to process and we have to be ready to train the system that everything will be done automatically in your case as well. That was, that was the beginning, that was 10 years ago. That's time. Later on, we decided we think like how we can automatize our job as well. And we come with the idea that maybe we don't need to replace just the juniors accountants, somebody who is just typing documents to the system, but let's go to replace the supervisor, somebody who is checking, checking, the, checking the juniors and uh, checking uh, if the bookkeeping is done okay. Do you know, typical cr supervisor, they have some cross checklist, what they need to do, what was everything done. We realize that uh, many of the activities can be replaced by the system as well. So for example, if I look on the, mm, uh, that I will come next, but we decided we will develop the system which will check it, this kind of thing. So we have a tool, when the bookkeeping is done, we take the journal, all the transaction, everything goes through the tool, and uh, you get in few seconds the report, like this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, let's go do something with that. Then we realize that many of our supervisors, they have a lot of time because this is really saving a lot of time on the supervision time. So we decided we let's go to do just the BPO, let's go start to do the advisory. So many of our um, super, like, um, supervisors are really in charge with final due diligence and other activities. After you pass thousands, thousands of the financial due diligence, you realize that you get the different knowledge, different knowledge how to look on the figures in the bookkeeping. So we start to focus if we can dedicate the frauds in the bookkeeping. So later on, if the clients are coming to us, and I, as I say, we are not the banks. If somebody's come to me and told me, I am interested in that company, I would like to buy it, let's go do the financial due diligence. I'm not just focusing on the financial statement. I'm not just focusing uh, on uh, uh, information from the questionnaire. Everything that I'm doing, I'm taking the journal, all of the transaction, passing it through our system, which consists hundreds or thousands of the rules, which we collected in the previous years as a knowledge, and taking, uh, giving us the reports. I consider this transaction can be considered as a fraud. Let's go ask the, 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 the target company if it's okay or no. So just why I'm here, I think, because we have experience with this part of the activity, they have something what to do with the financial sector, but not at, at all. And you are, uh, sorry, you are using this tool only internally? Or? We are doing, using it now just internally. We are using it for our internal purposes. So we are checking if our bookkeeping for our clients is correct. That's one thing. And second thing, if somebody is interesting, uh, like for the financial due diligence, we are not doing just due diligence, like um, taking 10 people to the rooms, letting them sit on the table, and going through all the data. We are using and training still our system and checking if the system is really able to recognize uh, some of the mistakes. I can give you an example. For example, if I have a, a financial, uh, if I take a journal from, the, from, the, from some of the clients and I see the clients is permanently withdrawing the money from the bank account. Mm -hmm. If I uh, look that all of the money end up in the petty cash. If I see that the petty cash is used mostly to pay the, the business allowances, uh, my first question is supposed to be if this client is not trying to avoid to pay the dividend tax because the company in, uh, at the end of the year end up close to zero, but you have this kind of transaction. So automatically one of the rules which are supposed to follow if this company is not trying to avoid uh, the, the pay, but this is just one rule. I'm talking about thousands and thousands different rules which you need to follow, which if you, you can do it manually, but if you replace by the system, automatically you will save a lot of the time. You just get a report, hey, this is a risky, ask your clients or ask the call company if you don't want to do differently. So this is something. Really I expect that you are going to expand with this kind of we will see. internal tool in the future. Uh, just so one, one more question to it. Uh, 
uh, from my point of view, well, can something like this be used uh, maybe in the government security system in the future? Or uh, we were even interesting in it. We are even interesting in it if tax authority can even uh, tax authority can even use because if the tax authority will t make the tax audit and they, they can use our system or they will use in the, our system in future, they can exactly based on this rule to see what transaction are, can be considered as a tricky, can be considered as a fraud. Yes, can be used even uh, because when I uh, myself uh, as a journalist, I when I was working perhaps with Jan Kuciak, mm -hmm. uh, we were working on many many mm -hmm. documents, and something like this could really help us to trace something that we would yes. have to find manually. So it's yes, yes, uh, it's yes, rather yes, complicated. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, um, I'm the co-founder of Blue Ops. Um, it's a Budapest-based company. Uh, we, are crea we created a digital wealth management platform for banks, asset managers, uh, independent advisory groups, and uh, we, are, uh, we have a special focus on social responsible investing. Uh, the biggest problem in wealth management, uh, if it's not that digitized, that it's, uh, uh, if you need a proper investment advice or proper portfolio management, you need to have hundreds of thousands of euros because one advisor can deal with maybe 50 clients, maybe 60, maybe 100, but not more. So uh, I think these days more and more banks need a scalable solution for this problem so they can give unique uh, advice to their customers, unique about uh, considering their background, their needs, their investment goals, uh, their risk uh, profile and everything. And it's, it's not an easy task, but it can be totally automatized. That is, this is what we are doing. Uh, I guess in these conferences, uh, many times the bank fintech cooperation comes up, and uh, probably we are a good example that uh, banks and fintech cooperation can work very well. Uh, we are financed by one of the biggest banks in Hungary, and they are also a client of us, and they, we started in their incubation program, actually. Uh, they also invested money in us. Uh, actually, they have their third batch uh, starting uh, this December. So uh, it really worked well for us. But uh, many of these digital wealth management platforms are still trying to be independent. But all the data, all the statistics says or uh, proves that the cooperation works way, way, way better. Because the fintechs have the agility, the technology, uh, the new idea, while the banks have a good customer base, so, uh, which you can uh, already apply your solution to. So that's why we are doing and we are always looking for more uh, bank partners to, to expand. Right, gentlemen, the core of this uh, discussion is, of course, finance, uh, but also AI, uh, artificial intelligence, which is a term which is quite misunderstood, misinterpreted in these days. Uh, I mean, if a computer does something clever or uh, a software does something nice, everybody says, oh, this is AI, or this is really, really something, but it doesn't have to be in this case. Uh, do you come across uh, quite frequently with the fact that people misunderstand what AI really is? Uh, do you come across uh, the situation when you really have to explain from the, from the beginning how, how does these uh, machines or these uh, softwares work? Uh, yes, quite often. And AI itself has a very broad definition. So everyone, every single person has his own definition of AI. But uh, what, uh, like for most general definition of what AI is, is basically computer making a decision on its own without being explicitly programmed, uh, without being said to make that decision. So it's automatically figuring out based on the data points, based on the inputs, uh, what decision it should take. So I think that's, that's the very basic uh, AI. But then AI itself is a very broad topic. And it can be further divided into uh, machine learning, which is, a, again, a subtopic of AI. Then machine learning itself, uh, again, uh, quite a broad topic, further divided into uh, unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. I think uh, what uh, what the current focus, or when you see companies like DeepMind and Google, what they're mainly focusing on is like mainly unsupervised and reinforcement learning. It's, uh, it's quite similar to how we humans learn. So it's basically learning from experimentation and learning from data points. So I think that's, that's what uh, one of the things when we start with AI. We explain them how the broader picture is, as well as how it can help, and uh, how uh, AI is uh, quite broad, but uh, there are like a lot of sub-subjects uh, within AI. So for example, in machine learning, when we talk about Zappi, we say like Zappi is more like unsupervised learning. So it observes employee on the background, 
and then it forms a process, a business process automation out of that. So it basically what it does is it maps data points, understands the context of what employee is doing. So it works across the application. So it works on your like it's an installation on Windows machine, and then it observes okay uh, what the person is doing, uh, the kind of task he is doing, and if he is doing something which is kind of quite repetitive rule based, then it can suggest to automate that. So that's one way of how AI can work, but there are like a lot of other ways uh, of AI. So for example, like majority of our devices we use uh, basically have AI, some form of AI in them. But when we say truly smart uh, machine learning or truly smart AI, I think we are still quite a long way uh, from that because I think one of the major difficulties of AI is like it requires a lot of repetition of same kind of uh, data structure, same kind of task, uh, which is one of the challenges which we are solving. Basically, how we can uh, use uh, experiences. Like, for example, uh, when I learn to drive a car, uh, uh, like when I change my car, I don't need to learn driving from scratch again, which is quite difficult in AI. Like, basically, when it learns a specific topic, it's really good at that specific topic. But when the thing changes or the environment changes, it's uh, difficult to transfer that learning. And I think that's that's one of the uh, difficult challenges which AI is facing. So in a nutshell, uh, like yeah, everyone has uh, their own definition of AI, but more broadly, uh, anything which computer does uh, on its own can be termed as AI. And I think uh, yes, uh, from uh, the people whom we have spoken to, some of some people think like AI is magic. Like I give it some data and it does everything for me. But in the background, it does require a lot of data cleaning, a lot of understanding of the process or the mm -hmm. problem you are trying to solve, rather than just applying AI to some data and expecting something magical out of it. All right. Any other experiences? Well, uh, hello. Uh, in our case, uh, it's, uh, thank you for that, for the classification and scientific introduction. Scientific introduction. So we would be mostly in the sort of supervised uh, learning cohort, uh, what we do. and. There's a little bit of magic in there as well because, like, when we look at people's financial lives, what we derive is uh, is hundreds of different signals and characteristics that actually change over time, and then you would be using uh, a plethora of, of algorithms where you would be testing like which one best explains and best predicts uh, what may be expected in the future. And in our experience, it's not only the algorithms that are right now open source, so you can really go out there and uh, get the best the world can offer. It's, it's, it's mostly about getting the data, well, data right, and, and in place, you know, clean and talking to each other, really making sure that the data actually is valid, uh, and it's just not noise. But then also coming up with a few ways how to construct a data model in a sense, like what's the important features, what are the important variables, what are the hypotheses that come in. Then on top of this, you can do a lot of uh, algorithmic data crunching to come up with the result. But in our world, is really, well, as you said, we have no difficulty in explaining this to uh, to banks because the result is uh, is a is a nice target. I mean, we want to say drive sales and increase increase the response rates or you know uh, improve the the short modeling. So w we know exactly what we are doing. The the process in the midst is pretty much not that important from the client's perspective. But uh, even in the process, the modeling is one thing, but really getting the data and the, uh, and the features and the hypothesis right is really important. Do banks have a heavy interest in this kind of software or, or this kind of uh, processing of data? Well, yes, and we are happy to, uh, we are happy to observe that. And really, I mean, like you, you can focus on risk management and really enrich the, the, the processes inside and, and do uh, better scoring. You can do quite a bit on uh, spot of spotting early signals of, of distress. And on the sales, uh, it's, it's very simple. I mean, getting the most out of every client interaction and at the same time increasing the customer engagement through being relevant. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, I think the main goal is now how to sell the artificial intelligence and robot to the s normal people, like yeah. employees, because they are scared that they can be replaced by the robots, replaced by the artificial intelligence. This is something we even faced in our company, because you need to come to the pe uh, person and tell, you have to train something which will, in the end, replace your job. 
but this is not the reality because you, when you look on the share service center, when you look on the factories, the people, they act like robots because you give them manuals. You tell them you have to do like this and they are just following them. So if you tell them like this part of the job, which is boring for you, which is something which, uh, which is uh, recurring or repeating, the simple task will be replaced by the robots and you can train the robots or you can train the artificial, you have a time to do something which is more interesting for you. So I think this is the main goal which we are facing in the organization, how to sell to the people that the robots and the artificial intelligence are not something which is wrong. It's something which will can help you and help to your personal development. You can do something else, something better than this simple task. So this is, I think, I don't want to talk technically, I'm not so good in technical things like the guys on my right side, but from my experience. Well, it's an advantage because uh, when people are working, they are also complaining, so yes, computers don't do that. Sorry? I think, yeah, that's, that's exactly uh, quite a bit of like feedback or like quite a bit of like employees uh, were concerned when we were like trialing happy at some of our clients, uh, uh, like clients machine and uh, some of their in-house like systems, like they were quite worried, uh, like whether happy will replace uh, their jobs. But uh, what we say, like AI is more like, it will replace the things uh, which are quite like uh, rule-based boring which the employee typically doesn't want to do. So my previous background before starting Zappi, I was working at Citibank. And in Citibank, uh, our middle and back office, we used to have a lot of processes, uh, I would say ranging from the department. Around 50 to 70% of the processes were quite uh, manual, just because we didn't had uh, a good technology. Uh, our systems kept on changing. The compliance kept on changing. So uh, when we were there, we noticed like, uh, uh, like every employee, every single employee wasn't happy with the job they are doing, mainly because uh, it's like a lot of rules, a uh, lot of like reputation, and uh, some of the employees, they were working like 12, 13 hours a day, mainly uh, due to like lack of the technology helping them. So what Zappi provides is basically a way for them to automate uh, bits and pieces of the work. So instead of working 12 hours, uh, they can work seven hours. So that's what we uh, try to convince people. But it's always here. Like people see AI uh, both both as a positive and a negative. Some people are afraid, like whether it will actually replace. And also the pace of innovation is increasing. So if we see like revolutions, uh, industrial revolution took around 50 to 100 years, but now AI is super fast. Like it's changing industries like uh, 10 years. Uh, if we say last 10 years, uh, like digital uh, industry has changed significantly. So I think that that's what people are quite a uh, bit worried on. But again, there is a lot more positive benefits which AI can provide. So like employees no longer have to work uh, 13, 15 hours work day. They can spend more time with the family, uh, do something which they are more interested in or more around like improving the customer service. Uh, as you said, like reallocating some of the jobs, redefining the jobs. And I think that that's what uh, is like quite the focus of like some of our clients. And I think that that's what like banks should uh, view like AI as a tool to enable them to uh, like uh, improve their existing technology as well as uh, to improve the customer services and uh, more around like improve the services they provide to the clients. Mr. Falvey? Yeah, so basically uh, most people think that AI is Skynet <laughs> from the Terminator movie, uh, or at least they think that it's something that will turn against us. But uh, uh, we are not even close to that, and uh, probably that's uh, that's not the good point to to start with the whole uh, topic. Right now, most of the financial world uh, uses AI for very specific uh, areas, and they are most of the time they are not connected to each other. So, I'll just one example: what we are doing, we are doing machine learning uh, for monitoring uh, the retail clients' uh, behavior. For example, how many times do they log in? to the system to check their portfolio's performance during a market downturn. Uh, and if the, cl uh, the client does it too often, it probably his risk profile is not adjusted right because he is too nervous, for example. Uh, and then AI can readjust uh, the risk profile, the risk aversion score for this uh, particular client. Uh, the problem is that you need a lot of data for this. You need uh, many, many clients to examine this and also you need quality data for this, so uh, during a, a bull market, uh, it, it, you, you, it won't work. You won't see uh, if the clients are nervous or not because they, they gain money. Uh, so um, this is why sometimes we see AI to be uh, 
expanding not as fast. Even though some of the technologies are ready, uh, we need a lot of data and we need uh, implementation and we need the right mindset from people. But there is an area, for example, in wealth management, or I should even say, uh, better say trading, uh, where AI almost completely taken uh, the lead or the whole field. Uh, this is the high frequency trading part. Uh, there was a so-called flash crash around, uh, I don't know, what was it, five or six years ago. So it's, it's not even a very recent event. And uh, this was caused by uh, high frequency trading. And high frequency trading is very, very fast. So it's literally faster than the blink of an eye. Uh, and you don't know, it's a completely uh, uh, unique, independent ecosystem almost inside the whole trading area. And you don't know what exactly is happening. And uh, that's why uh, it is going to really revol revolutionize everything when it will broad to uh, all, the, all the areas uh, or it will expand to all the areas because uh, it is very, very fast and uh, you don't even know how they work, at least not at the moment. Uh, you've mentioned uh, when you were communicating before the conference uh, about the conservativeness of the retail sector. But the automation is uh, coming already. Uh, what will it change in the future? Yeah, oh, we can see two big, uh, let's say, market segments. One is, uh, that, that's a simplification, obviously, but one is over 40 or over 45, maybe. Uh, they are very conservative. They use technology. Uh, um, even it was mentioned that, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, the CIO of Tatra Bank who said uh, just an hour ago that his mother is 70 years old and uses uh, Google on, on her phone. Uh, so they use technology, but they think it is uh, a layer, uh, um, an independent tool. Uh, under 40, people are uh, already um, think of technology as, uh, as a, a core part of their life. So they don't exist without a Facebook profile, for example. Or uh, they don't exist if they don't post every day on Instagram. Okay, I'm joking a little bit, but uh, the the social uh, part and the uh, digital part is, is the core of their life right now. And they think uh, that uh, all the financial tools uh, should be digitized, including wealth management. So, but the, the problem is that they are too young. They didn't inherit uh, the baby boomers money so far, and uh, they don't earn as, mu as much as money as uh, uh, people over 40, but it will change soon. So in, in the next, next coming, five to ten years, uh, uh, digitization will expand very, very fast because this, the generation, will take over. Right. Uh, Mr. Agrawal, uh, you, have, you are using or you are selling two tools. Uh, it's Zappi and Zappi Analytics. So what's the main difference between them? Uh, so Zappi is uh, one that sits on employee's computer. Mm -hmm. So Zappi basically uh, runs in the background. So it's there when you need it. So for example, when I'm typing an email, uh, when I type the subject as introduction to integer AI, uh, Zappi will suggest, uh, like, this is the content uh, you have typed previously. Should I do it for you? Or uh, when I'm, like, uploading some data from Excel to some in-house application or, like, doing some data manipulation, again, Zappi will come at the top of the window. So I think we have a case study uh, after this panel discussion yeah. which will demonstrate that. Basically, it comes up at the desktop on the application depending on what you are doing and suggesting like you have done this previously, uh, should I automate it? So there are two ways Zappi can automate your task. One is unaided, where it suggests like when it observes that you are doing something similar again. Secondly, uh, you can train it as well. So you can manually say like I have an Excel sheet of like 1,000 rows or I have some data format and I need to manipulate that. So I will do it once uh, and I will say Zappi like just uh, watch my behavior and then Zappi can replicate that behavior 1,000 times or as many times as you want. So that's Zappi. Zappi Analytics is a layer on the top. Uh, basically, uh, it works at a central uh, repository, or it's more like a machine learning component. So it does not sit on employee's desktop, but it's shared uh, by a team or different data points. So basically, whatever the employee is doing, Zappi co collects the behavior of that uh, employee. So if I'm working on Excel, it will say like I'm working on Excel with XYZ title, uh, and I'm doing XYZ stuff on Excel. So data points such as mouse clicks, keyboard action, as well as the context of the application. 
once it has collected this data, it can uh, group people into teams. So you have like say a team of 100 people. SAP Analytics will say like, oh, this is like uh, 100 people. There are like eight teams, depending on what applications they are using, what kind of processes they are using. So it builds up a process map out of that. So uh, SAP Analytics is more like a team-based uh, machine learning uh, process discovery engine or process mining engine. So it starts to automatically mine processes in the business, especially when we see larger organizations and larger institutions, maybe more than 5,000 people. Uh, like uh, most of the time, uh, the management does not have a clue uh, what kind of processes are there in the business and uh, what actually is taking most amount of time, uh, most amount of money, and how can they improve their digital uh, footprint, digital strategy as well as help employees to do uh, work more efficiently. So this is what Zappi Analytics provides. So it works with a large number of employees and gives the management an overview of like the kind of time spent by employees on different application, different processes, and how they can be optimized or improved. So that's Zappi Analytics. So Zappi is something which helps employee uh, do his task faster, whereas Zappi Analytics collects the data points from different employees and generates a process map, which helps the management to make better decisions on optimizing the process. Uh, you promise around a 70% increase in productivity in some of the processes, and yes. uh, I think a third of the reduction of the costs. Operating costs. How do you, how do you manage to get, I, I must say, such, such impressive results? Uh, I think it depends on the roles in the department, but uh, when we look at the financial industry, and uh, especially middle and back office, uh, they have a lot of like inefficiencies, uh, mainly due to the systems they are using, as well as uh, like uh, the kind of works uh, which is kind of repetitive rule based. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can guarantee like with Zappi Analytics, basically it analyzes uh, at a very macro or micro level. So it goes down to atomic scale with uh, keystrokes, mouse clicks, and it uh, uses this uh, micro details to build up a micro process which allows the organization to uh, really like uh, take a take a like step forward uh, so if organization is like maybe 5 years behind the current technology trend with zappi analytics basically it helps them to uh, close the gap uh, based on the analysis and the processes it generates so uh, typically like uh, when we say like things such as like trade reconciliation uh, settlement data upload uh, invoice processing client onboarding these are the kind of processes we, where we have actually proven like around 70% productivity improvements uh, where like people do a lot of like repetitive task uh, rule based again uh, like taking data from one place and uh, and putting it to the second uh, like internal application so it's all like kind of like uh, a bank or an organization which has multiple systems which are quite independent and uh, are not talking to each other basically is happy eliminates uh, the need for them to talk to each other uh, through api but rather, it, uh, it works uh, based on now how the human works. So it works on the interface layer or mm -hmm. the UI layer. So it uh, makes it much more efficient for them to deploy automation much quickly rather than like building the whole uh, software from the scratch. So it depends on the use case uh, application. But typically, 30% is the reduction we see in a majority of like middle back office uh, departments or increase in operating efficiency in those kind of scenarios. Uh, just shortly, uh, do you have to customize every uh, the, the Zappi software? Do you have to customize it for every client, or is it universal? It can be implemented in any system. Uh, so a mix of both. Uh, so it's a universal software. So uh, on an employee level, Zappi is basically uh, works out of the box. For Zappi Analytics, there is some piece of customization rules necessary. So basically, in financial services, there are like a lot of compliance, auditing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera requirements uh, where you have to additionally make sure whatever uh, the robot is doing or Zappi is doing is according to the rules. So I think that's, that's where the majority of the customization piece come into place. But uh, it can automatically recognize what application you're working, what kind of data you are doing. So it can read PDF files. Uh, it can read text files. It can read images. It can read Excel. It can work across your in-house application work on browser, so if you are doing... You're going to mention it in the case oh, yeah. study, I understand. Chrome, so. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Chevik, we were uh, talking about personalized banking uh, as, as the one, of, one of the future. Uh, what do you expect it's, uh, it's going to look like uh, maybe in the upcoming years? Uh, by using AI, of course, in this case. Well, th that's a good question. 
and predicting future is always a little bit difficult, but what we see now and where we come from is that, you know, banks sit on the best data you can imagine. I mean, like, the data really describes a person's life, real choices, real preferences, and you can deduce quite a bit from it. Uh, the question is how to use this and actually offer value uh, to the client as a service, uh, as an advice. So as far as personalization goes, I think it will move to tr truly one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication, one-on-one -on -one pricing maybe at some point, uh, which will be driven by one-on-one -on -one, uh, risk modeling uh, as well. But then what you can do and what the banks can do, I believe, is to build in a whole ecosystem of services around this understanding and be more uh, helpful in many ways. You know, banks know that a client is going through a real estate acquisition process. So they can look and focus on the mortgage itself, but they can do quite a bit. And we have seen a, you know, uh, uh, this happening a little bit. But then you're holding the mortgage, you're holding the house, you're renting it out, a bank could be also helpful there, you know, like uh, giving you a simple tool to uh, to manage the rent, to tell you what is the appropriate rent uh, at the location, to tell you if your tenant missed a payment, for example, and you need to do something about it. Uh, we have AI technologies that could help you uh, review your legal contracts and say pinpoint, uh, some areas which are not well crafted or uh, or missing and then you know with the house you want to sell the house you go out there uh, a bank can give you a, a nice price map uh, of what could be expected uh, you could you could expect uh, uh, to get for the house help you with the legal uh, aspect as well not just acquiring but selling as well so you know for me the personalization is it's about being one-on-one, -on -one, but really also offering and being relevant in terms of services and value. Mm -hmm. And uh, one to topic that is really, really close to my heart is, uh, you know, really helping people better understand their finance. And by this, I mean not really showing them a spending report, in a sense, and just, you know, expecting for people to, uh, well, to understand and take action. It's, it's not working. Uh, we honestly believe that the classical personal finance management tools as we see, it, I mean, they are dead in a sense. Uh, but what can be really done is, you know, well, first of all, making this accurate, you know, help people understand like, this is how much I'm spending on a household in a month. I mean, like, I don't know how many of you really, un you really know what is your average household spend per month, including payments that don't, ca don't happen on a monthly basis, but happen once a year. Like including you know insurance payments for example or taxes you pay uh, how many do you do you know do you know how much you spend on your household a month who knows I pay all the bills so I remember it correctly. well th there are there are bills that actually come every month but there are bills that don't come every month I mean like your car insurance for example is not a monthly uh, is not the monthly payment right how many of you have any exact understanding of your subscriptions that you have? Oh, not really. No. <laughs> I had a, uh, my own experience was, you know, I would I subscribe to, to The Economist, and then I found out that I wasn't reading it, but I learned that I was, I had a, I had a <laughs> subscription, you know, every three months where they deducted 60 euros from my account. It's like, oh yeah, and then you forget about it, and you just move on, and it just goes like this. I mean, People are on autopilot, in a sense, and money is a good example, right? I mean, and entering this arena and really making money issues and money management, you know, bringing it to the people, making it part of their life, just increasing the awareness, as I said, it, it could, could have a, a huge impact on how people sort of save, uh, how people spend their money, you know, being more conscious about their financial reserve. By the way, do you know, uh, say, well, I'm going to turn, not a question, but from what we have seen, you know, 50 to 60 percent of people have a financial reserve of how many months of their lives? What do you think? Half a year, maybe? Six months? A year, maybe? One month. Nice. One month. So that's... Uh, 
that's what's happening. I mean, it's very easy to spend. It's very easy, you know, uh, it's one click, it's fast, it's convenient. But at the same time, we just need to be aware that, you know, of the, what the financial situation is. And one month is, uh, I hope you would agree, a little less than what's appropriate. So, so the idea is to really uh, put a robot in place to uh, get this information and bring it to the client, make it sort of a part of the daily life, a part of a program. And this is one of the ways that, you know, a truly personalized uh, service could be offered to clients. All right. Uh, we mentioned there two projects. Uh, Mr. Pasek, you can uh, maybe add a few details about the uh, project that you are working right now. That's a good question because we don't know still yet what we'll do with our project because maybe we will start to sell it, maybe we'll give it... I'm just it. trying to push you into that <laughs> answer if you notice. That's, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good question because uh, even internally we are thinking if you not give this project for free. So this is one of the options that we have something which we'll give it, we'll launch it next year and we'll give it to free to use to everybody because you know, we have, we are uh, accounting firm, we are BPO company, we have a lot of data but they are not enough for us because you need a lot of data and we need more and more data. So maybe we'll give the, the, the tool to the people to just use it, to collect and to get additional data which we needed to, to train the system even be better and better. So we don't know. So that's, uh, we are at a stage that we don't know what we'll do. If you will sell it, if you do it just internally, or you'll give it just free. It it's may, may, ha may happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Falweg, you mentioned a project as well. Uh, what, what are you currently working on? Yeah, uh, our uh, main project is a uh, uh, digital wealth management solution for the private banking operation of MKB Bank, the, the bank I, I mentioned before. Um, I'm not sure if, if you were referring to this. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the interesting thing is that uh, they have almost uh, 2,000 clients. They are all high net worth individuals, but uh, it's still very, very hard to handle all these uh, people. Uh, they have about uh, 20 advisors, so you can count that almost 100 clients uh, belongs to one advisor. And uh, this is not portfolio management. This is investment advice, so each and every transaction should be discussed with the client. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the new MIFID regulations, but they have to uh, report everything, every advice, and they have to report uh, it uh, in, a, in a way which re the regulator uh, demands. So it's not an easy task, so we help them with this too. Uh, and the most interesting part is that um, we have our own algorithm uh, to create and rebalance portfolios, but we apply this algorithm uh, so they can um, give in inputs to the system. For example, what kind of uh, macro data, mac for example, what uh, GDP, CPI, or, or uh, even stock market data uh, estimation they have. And uh, we can apply this data to uh, each client's portfolio. So for example, if the private banking department's investment committee says that uh, the American GDP will not uh, expand as much as fast as in the last couple of years or even a recession is coming, uh, the system will lower the weight of the portfolio, uh, the weight of the US stock portfolio in each uh, uh, portfolio, but according to or uh, in respect with the limitations of each client. And this is totally uh, automated. So uh, just a couple of years ago, it was uh, done by, by hand or in Excel, maybe. Uh, now it's way, way, way faster. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that sooner or later, if we have enough data, we will be able to apply machine learning to this part of uh, the portfolio construction as well. So what kind of uh, inputs uh, do the clients, I mean the B2B clients, give into the system? And uh, how does it work for each portfolio and how successful they are. Is it helping or is it okay if just using the, let's say the Bloomberg estimate consensus? So this is a very, very uh, exciting uh, part. And sooner or later, uh, more and more digitization can come to the investment de decision part as well. Not only the onboarding, not only uh, uh, the tax optimization, not only uh, the back office, not only monitoring the client, but the investment part as well. So, yeah, this is a really interesting thing we are working on now. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, as I promised, we are going to take some questions from Slido as well. We basically have a few... 
less than a few minutes left. Uh, all right, the first question. Is Zappy AI software on local server? Is it secure to not leak? This is a question for you, of course. Uh, internal information outside of company. Uh, so answer is yes. Uh, so like Zappy server is uh, all installed in like uh, in-house like organization's own data center. <coughs> so no data leaves uh, outside the organization. It's not connected to the internet as well, so uh, you can be assured about that. All right, and the second question uh, is probably going to be addressed to a wider... To what extent GDPR uh, hinders the development of AI? Example of a nervous customers provided uh, by the panelists amounts to profiling you need to inform users. It likes a question mark, but it's a question nonetheless. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question uh, well, but uh, you mean you someone doesn't inform the customer and starts to make a profile based on on what kind of data? That's what I get that, from that's it. The, I that's the that's uh, the the point. That's the most important part of of this uh, problem. What kind of data uh, do they uh, use use for profiling? Because there, there can be uh, three kinds of data, I think, basically. One, which is already provided by the client to the, to the bank, for example. Uh, the second, which is openly publicly available. And the third, which is not publicly available, and it was not provided by the client, at, not, at least not to the bank who uses it. Uh, if you use the first two, uh, especially the first with the comprehensive and compliant um, um, informing the client in a compliant way, uh, then it's it's not a problem. Uh, the second is also not a problem because it's publicly available data. So uh, it really depends on what kind of data are we talking about. All right. I would like to thank you to Balash Falovegi. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Thank you to Peter Bashek. To Eric Chebik and Mr. Ambuch Agrawal. Uh, this discussion is going to be followed by a case study, which will take about 15 minutes. After that, you can have a coffee break for a half an hour or so. Thank you very much for the attention.